Welcome to the virtual campfire. My name is Sydney Williams, author and founder of Hiking My Feelings, and I'm so glad that you're here. The virtual campfire started as a replacement for what we were missing on the trail during the pandemic in 2020. We wanted to be sharing stories and listening to music and having conversations about hard topics at the end of a long day, shared in some of the most beautiful places in the world. In the absence of that, the virtual campfire was born and 50 something episodes later, we're still here. And this season, we're doing things a little bit differently. Over the course of the next few episodes, we're going to be sharing stories from people who have been through our 12 week online program called Blaze Your Own Trail to Self Love. Now, if you've been watching the virtual campfire or listening to the podcast from the beginning, you'll know that this program was launched after our initial 20 episodes of the virtual campfire. This program took everything that we had planned to do on the road in 2020 on my book tour through the US and Canada, workshops, retreats, overnights, group hikes, all of those things, and put them into a 12 week program that was available online so we could stay connected during the pandemic. Now we are getting ready to start our fourth class of this program on August 21st, and we couldn't think of a better way to get people hyped up about it, bring awareness to what we're doing, and share the stories of how this program has impacted real human lives than to bring on some of the people that have been through the program themselves. So I hope you have a nice, comfortable seat. I hope you have a beverage of choice, maybe a cozy blanket, maybe a journal. You never know what you're gonna hear that you might wanna jot down. So have a seat, sit back, relax, unless you're driving, then <laughs> keep doing what you're doing. But we hope you enjoy the virtual campfire. Thank you so much for being here. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. <laughs> I me haven't too. had thanks. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I haven't had Gabachi on in forever. So hi, friend. How are you? I am well. How are you? I'm good. Uh for anybody that doesn't know you, um, give us a little bit of info. Like who are you? Uh, where are you from? What are you doing? What's that gorgeous background behind you? And then we'll go from there. Yes. Well, this gorgeous background is the Oregon Mountain Desert Peaks National Monument in southern New Mexico. I highly recommend y'all make that a stop on a, on a road trip or just make a trip down south to to see these beautiful mountains. I mean, like literally never gets old. I just any excuse I have to go to Las Cruces, I do because I just like to stare at them. And you can actually see them from all over town. Like the Walmart parking lot has an amazing view of the organs, which always blows my mind. It's like beautiful sunsets from Walmart. Great. Um, but anyway, that to say that I am Gabachia uh, Moreno. I am affiliated with Hiking My Feelings, um, both as a program participant in the past and currently as a member of the board of directors serving as director of social responsibility, which pretty much means that we try to meet as, soon, as often as we can to talk about how we can continuously make sure that the programming from Hiking My Feelings is as inclusive, as accessible, um, as we can to make sure that it can reach all the communities that it has the potential to reach. Um, other than that, I am uh, knee or neck deep involved in the conservation community and the outdoor recreation community. Um, as one, as a National Monuments Fellow at uh, an organization called Nuestra Tierra Conservation Project, which is based in Las Cruces, New Mexico, which is why I'm so lucky to visit these bad boys all the time. Uh, and then also uh, I serve as executive director for the Outdoors Oath, where I get to do more of my outdoor education work, uh, mostly uh, focused on allyship in um, terms of, you know, protecting the planet, making sure that the outdoors are inclusive and making sure that adventure is accessible to everyone. In a nutshell, what else? Well, where I'm from, kind of from all over the place, uh, was born in the US, but grew up in the South of Mexico. And I currently live in Northern New Mexico in ancestral uh, Pueblo and Jicarilla Apache lands. 
Boom. Oh my gosh. So many mic drops. One boom, shout out boom, outdoors. Boom. Oh, shout out Luis Tierra. Shout out Gabacha being back on the podcast. I'm so excited. Shout to out have hiking you here. my feelings. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and also shout and out also. hiking my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So for everybody that is new to this podcast, we're doing things a little bit differently this time. Um, in the past, we've interviewed outdoor experts, mental health experts, inspirational folks, uh, musicians, all kinds of things. And we're kind of doing a little bit of that here, but we are aligning each episode to match up with a module from our signature program, which is Blaze Your Own Trail to Self-Love. And I've got Gabachi on for week one, which is our foundational exercise called our Trail of Life Maps. And my first question for you, Gabachia, what was on your trail of life that led you to hiking my feelings? You know, at that point, I think when I when I first found out about uh, hiking my feelings, and I think I've said this to you before, you were doing an Instagram live and somebody had shared about it. And it was all about, you know, using the trail for your own personal healing. And I think at that point, um, just to give a little bit of context, I grew up pretty much outdoors. I didn't know that there was a separation between outside or inside. Like it's just life happens, you know in all the spaces <laughs> and so af but after high school I went and I moved to Mexico City and then I lived in LA and then I lived in New York City and I feel like immersing myself in this like urban jungles kind of made me uh, separated me from my connection to nature and at the time I encountered hiking my feelings and this was probably like five years ago oh my gosh four years ago four years four ago, years ago. yeah, it four yeah years ago? it'll be four years yeah it's been four years why? Because right. it was about <laughs> six years ago that I started like reconnecting and I started getting outside more. And then about a year and a half later, started getting more into like the different niches of what it means to be, you know, like outside and like starting to explore different perspectives and also starting to kind of understand more how like the infrastructure of outdoor recreation works in this country because I grew up in Mexico where our infrastructure is barely there and it works very differently right so kind of getting more involved I had started volunteering and doing other things with other organizations and so I found out about it I thought you know what what a powerful message to use the trail as a tool for healing uh, for yourself but also the way that hiking my feelings was doing that was through sharing, right? Like the, the personal story at that time was your story, Sydney, uh, to help other folks see how they can also use the trail for their own um, self-healing. Yes. And so, and then we connected in the She Explores Facebook group, I believe. So thank you, mm -hmm. Gail, for creating that beautiful space and yes. for giving me an opportunity to share my story when it was like so new and this wasn't an organization. The book wasn't out yet. I was just like, I have this phrase I like to use and I'm talking about healing. Like really, really thankful for Gail to, to give some space to that. Um, and then we were able to meet up in Montana when you were working with the Conservation Corps up there. Um, and then and you were doing we were, your tour. Yeah. Right. And I, we were on tour and then you were working with Joshua Tree National Park Association. And that's where we actually like started brainstorming about how we could save the world together. Um, was a little coffee shop in Whitefish, Montana. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, Hey, I'm curating this series of events at Joshua Tree National Park. And I think you could host one of them. And you were like, yes, <laughs> yes. Very happy. Um, and so, okay, so we connected, we had plans for world domination, not world domination, world collaboration in 2020. Collaboration and collaboration. Yeah, yes. yeah. I don't like the domination. I'm all about the no, collaboration. We're not dominating anything, please. <laughs> oh, at all. So we're, uh, we're out here just trying to make the world a little bit better than we found it. And you ended up signing up for our program, Blaze Your Own Trail to Self Love. So Tell me about how the trail of life exercise went for you and how your trail of life has kind of developed in the year. Oh my gosh. Two years since that program started. Wow. Oof. I mean, I honestly, I love that exercise so much because it made me look back and it also forced me to because I feel like it's easy to, when we think about healing, we're like looking back and reflecting and it's very easy to like fall into like the darkest moments, right? 
And Trail of Life kind of forced me to say like, okay, while all this shit was happening, other nice stuff was happening. So like, let's try to connect to that. And so it really, um, it helped me like be more purposeful about thinking about my life and not defining it by like, oh, the hard things that I overcame, but no, the things that came easy, the things that, you know, like my brother was born. That was amazing. You know, like remembering like me having like a living doll pretty much, right. That's something I could feed and the the milk wouldn't just run over (laughs) on the plastic. You know, it's just like the little things in life that that make me who I am, that is my life. And that is not just like, not just the hardship that happened, but like everything, the, the simple things. Like it made me remember like my mom's perfume and how that used to be like very comforting and how I wanted to use that perfume when I grew up, you know, just little things like the taste of wood. Like I, it made me remember the first time I licked some wood at a friend's house because they had wooden floors and I was like, I have to taste this. <laughs> I must have been like three years old. Like, I don't know. So it's like, it, I think it's a beautiful exercise because it, it allows you to go as deep as you want. You can keep it as shallow as you want. Um, but also when you start going through it, like it, at least when it happened to me and I started seeing how I'm putting all this hard stuff there and just thinking like, hmm, that's not it. There's more. And like that invitation to go into the more and be more purposeful of like, not just the bad stuff. Okay. For each bad stuff, there has to be a good stuff good thing right so trying to um going through that balance and and just thinking about your life as this story that you can look at from kind of the outside and and be a a, a spectator for a change instead of getting all into the weeds of like the ego of my life right and then trying to to deodorize it or to make it dramatic because that makes me feel alive and fulfilled and like I have intense emotions like what happens if I just look at it and like try to be more factual about it? So that was really helpful. I like that the part about looking at it and being more factual about it. And that's something that I realized in just like, I credit Brene Brown for this phrase. It's opened up way more difficult conversations than I was ever previously capable of having. But mm-hmm. I always say like the story I'm telling myself is because like in my mind, some of the stories I used to tell myself, which were dramatic, which were over the top, which were largely focusing on only the bad things that had happened to me or that I had done it. Not all of it was factual. Like I, I made it dramatic because to your point, like that made me feel like better or alive or something feel anything really. Cause there were some years where like feeling anything was great. Cause sometimes we go numb for a bit. So I really appreciate that, that acknowledgement that there's an opportunity to look at everything just kind of like from the outside, which we don't really get taught how to do. And I, and at least for me, it's been a really big stress reducer when I go through anything. And I, I, since I have been doing this program, like we've had three classes of people, we've done a handful of workshops on the side and we've hosted this as a retreat twice. And to see all the different ways that it comes together is just so cool. So when you made your first trail of life, did you do a list? Did you get like artistic with it? What's, um, what's your medium for trail of life and self-reflection? I really just went down the list. I remember that because I had just pages of like, this happened, this happened, this happened. Um, and it wasn't even chronological. It was just like, whatever memories and like you know how memories bring up other memories so like once I started remembering something and something else will come up um but yeah I just jotted down literally just a list nothing nothing super fancy then I was I think then I made it into something else I think I made something afterwards um but I remember a lot of the of the folks that were doing the program at that time like some folks got really beautifully creative and with it and I was like whoa nice um but also to say that like that's the beauty of that exercise right like if you have the time to sit down and like draw your life like you can and that's beautiful but then also you could just sit down and jot down and yeah it's, it still serves its purpose yeah i it's true we've seen i've seen some really beautiful art come out of that um somebody kind of like rapped or made a song in our last class um 
Alexis did a PowerPoint because that was like her like known way of organizing information. So it's really kind of limitless. But moving away from like the activity itself, if we think of the concept of like life as a trail and such like that, as you went through BYOT, we were asking like, what do you vision for your life? Like, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? Who do you want to spend your time with? What kind of adventures do you want to have? Do you remember what you were looking forward to and what you were visualizing back then? And has any of that come to fruition for you? Um, absolutely. I think my my biggest breakthrough from, from BYOT was some like big time money trauma that was um, a limiting beliefs that were not allowing me to have like the financial stability that I needed. Um, this was also like, you know, it was in the middle of the pandemic. I did have a full-time job, which was kind of like the first time in my life that I had a full-time job that was actually kind of paying the bills. Um, I had a house, a little house that, you know, we, um, me and my partner, me and my partner, me and my husband, sorry, recently <laughs> married. <laughs> That's not that I was like, okay, that sounds weird. He's not my partner. He's my husband. Uh, so me and my husband at the time were like, you know, after having lived on the road for a while, we had finally settled uh, here in New Mexico and had a little casita. And so like the financial stability was starting to show up, but the, you know, just like that internal limiting belief of like, this is going to get taken away from me, or this is not going to last, or this is just temporary and things can go down any moment. And like kind of, kind of living with that fear. Um, and also with that limiting belief of like everyone around me doesn't want me to succeed, where really at the time I had started surrounding myself with people who really wanted me to succeed. And that has shown in how at, at that point, like I knew that my biggest thing was like I wanted my full time job to be in the outdoors or related to the outdoors to, to conservation. Um, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't even a year later that that was like my life, you know, <laughs> like literally before, before the year mark from that time, I was able to, to already say that I work full time in conservation. So like a, you know, knock on wood and super grateful every day, my financial stability is still here. I don't believe that people around me don't want me to succeed anymore, which is huge. You know, it's like, Sure, some people might have envy or whatever, but like those are not the folks that I'm giving time to. And that understanding that the folks that I'm giving time to, we all understand that when we all do good, we all do good. Like we all do well, right? So like we're always sharing opportunities. Um, and then you know, it's like now I have more than a full time job <laughs> in the outdoors and, and conservation. So it's like now my whole life really and i'm so grateful that it revolves around helping people connect to nature helping people access nature uh working on legislation that helps people access nature uh really just creating education that helps people access nature in a more inclusive way i mean this these are just privileges that i cannot uh i i couldn't have imagined that would happen in over a year well, and with that said, I'd love to hear more about the work you're doing with both New Esther Chiera and um, the Outdoor Stove, because we were fortunate enough to be part of the founding members of the Outdoor Stove, and we're kind of watching the plane, as you guys build the plane as you were flying it. And then all of the sudden, you've educated like thousands of people <laughs> just out of nowhere. I'm sitting here like, hi, hiking my feelings. We've been like hustling just the two of us for like how long? And then you guys are just killing it. It's so cool to see. So take me through like a typical day for you, like what you're working on, who you're with, where you're going. Um, and tell us a little bit about the work you're doing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, you know, I, I love both my jobs and it's the reason why I have two, <laughs> not just one. Um, definitely with, uh, well, I'll start with Nuestra Tierra since I've been there the longest. Um, I I was brought in as National Monuments Fellow, which pretty much means that I get to participate in campaigns to, you know, kind of ensure that we have national monuments, especially new ones. Um, if you all haven't heard, the this administration uh, set up a goal of 
protecting 30% of our lands and waters by 2030. And so the, the 30 by 30 initiative, that's also known as America the Beautiful from our administration, they are really committed to it. And uh, part of my job is to hold them accountable to that. So I am part of a couple of coalitions uh, one is to protect Kastner Range, which is in El Paso, Texas. It's a beautiful mountain range that still stands in the middle of town. Uh, it used to be a military base. Uh, people don't really want access to it. We know there's some unexploded stuff on the ground because of testing and whatnot. So people don't want access to it, but they want to know that their children and their grandchildren are going to be able to wake up and have the mountains in town, which they had all this time, right? Like you've never heard about El Paso blowing up randomly in the mountains like that just hasn't happened and so really this is a, a half a century long campaign that has been asking for many many administrations to protect this um, beautiful mountain range in El Paso and so we're hoping that uh, President Biden will sign the Antiquities Act for us um, and so for anyone who's not familiar with the Antiquities Act it is a it's pretty much a bill that allows the president to sign um, any land as a national monument, literally just paper and signatures. Like, here you go, you have a national monument. This is a special power we gave to our presidents because our presidents have always been very involved in conservation and we wanted to make sure that, that they had some sort of agency um, that can allow for protection of our lands. Now that doesn't happen like the president shows up and it's like, this is cool mountain range, let's make it. Like, no, there's normally, like I said, coalition of uh, community leaders that are interested in the protection of the land, and then they make the ask, you know, they partner with senators or uh, representatives, and then you get all this kind of political momentum going, and that helps you get the thing across the finish line. It's not the only way. If the president doesn't sign it, Congress can sign it. There's other avenues, but we would love just to see Biden use the Antiquities Act because he can. And who wouldn't like that? I mean, if I were president, I would be mean, take this act away my whole life, right? My whole, my whole, um, yeah, my whole term or whatever. So anyway, that's, you know, that's part of the work that we do with Nuestra Tierra. But I, as I was saying, we're, we also work on legislation. So we have two other coalitions. One is a monumental shift, which is pretty much a group of diverse leaders that make sure that the national monument campaigns that are in place right now are honoring the people that are the closest to the lands that they're trying to protect. Because as we know, conservation traditionally has been laid by male, white folks that have their own interests involved in the protections where we want to know that these protections are for the benefit of the local communities and that represent the people that have the longest standing and the sacred ties to the land. So that's kind of what we do with the monumental shift. Um, and then another cool initiative that I love is the Outdoor Future, which is creating a national fund for um, outdoor equity, which pretty much is a big chunk of money that can get distributed in all the different states to programs that take kids outside, specifically kids from um, rural, urban, and tribal um, backgrounds, because those we identified as folks that have the least access to meaningful outdoor experiences. And so the outdoor future intends to kind of narrow those gaps and make sure that there's funds so that these programs that take the youth out can um, survive and, and have sustainable lives in, in our system. So that's Nuestra Tierra. We a question about that. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, me, question me. about that. Um, am, I, am I correct in my, assumption that a lot of work in conservation is playing the long game and that it's ensuring that even if you don't see it in your lifetime, perhaps the people coming up behind you in the organization will see it. Because it sounds like this is not an instant gratification thing. Anything dealing with the federal government moves at the speed of a snail from what I understand. So that is correct. <laughs> is that, have you found like, have you found yourself frustrated with the process? Are you inspired by the process? Like, how has it been moving into this conservation work? Yeah, so, I mean, like I said, I'm very privileged because I'm a fellow. So this is me in big part getting paid to learn. In big part, I bring a lot of, I mean, I bring my skill set from all the other five industries and careers I've had in my life this far. <laughs> 
which turn out they're very useful, which is great because then I feel useful. I don't feel like I'm just listening, right? Um, but it is, it definitely is um, patience. It definitely is, um, for me at least, in, in this first kind of um, few months of doing this, um, I will say I don't get frustrated about the long term because it's it's really interesting how on the one end you are feeding into the requests and the expectations of your funders, right? The people that pay for you to do this job, to do this work. And so that timeline feels a little bit faster than the actual timeline of getting things across the finish line. When I talk about Casner Range, I said that's been happening for 50 years. Literally half a century, people have gathered to try to protect this place and it's still not protected. So like, yes, you are playing the long game. You are definitely playing the game. And as much as you sometimes can see um, a very easy solution, like in this case, it's like the Antiquities Act, it's just so easy. The truth is that it's never that easy, right? It's not just a signature, it is a signature, it is a monument plan, it is a, a, it's a capacity issue, um, it's, a, it's a, bud, a government budget issue. And so once you start putting all the pieces together, it, it is a lot and it is a snail pace, um, but we do it because as long as we have this system, this is the way that we do things. Uh, we try to do them a little bit differently where we have uh, power to do so and influence to do so. Uh, with the outdoor future, for example, we've taken a whole year just to lay a strong foundation and trust within the team that's writing this piece of legislation. A whole year, I mean, like that's unheard of, right? Like people don't take that long. People, they are legislators. They come together, they're like, okay, let's draft this thing. And it's like, no, because nobody has ever drafted anything remotely similar to this, um, at least not at the federal level. We have a couple of um, state level outdoor equity funds like in New Mexico, California, and most recently Colorado. We have those that we can, you know, look back and, and learn from, but it's still a different game at the federal level. So we're just always um, trying to, to do with what we have. Oh, I dig it. And so I think you were gonna talk about like a day in the life of a fellow at this wonderful organization. A day in the life, a day in the life of the fellow is a lot of Zoom, a lot of Google Docs. <laughs> A lot of travel planning, believe it or not, uh, which is probably my favorite part. I love that my job takes me places and allows me to meet people, but it really is a lot of Zoom time. So when when I first heard about the Zoom fatigue, I was like, man, that's not right. But now I started to kind of get it. You know, it's like once you get to your later days, like meetings, you're like, yeah, I might want to be off camera for this one. It is real when you're on Zoom all day, you get Zoomed out. And so it's pretty much my day is email, Zoom, Google Docs. And then when I'm traveling and, and when I have the privilege, I get to go on field days and meet with people out on the land and you know go on hikes um, and um, also do public speaking. So like I might pop up at a panel with some senators or some Congress people and, it's really a lot of different things. Um, yeah, I know, right? So weird. It's like first time I'm like, yeah, really? I'm I'm here in a panel. I am asking the questions good. I also sometimes get to um, express my opinions, right? For public commentary on different initiatives of the government. And I get to be on some calls and get to, you know, see our administration in the face and be like, I need you to do this for me. I need you to ensure that our lands are going to be protected. I need you to go above 30%, you know, like I get to say that. And that's kind of um, the cool thing about being a fellow and working in conservation. Oh, I dig it. Now. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> when you were, when you, when we'll talk, I have one more question, then we'll chat about outdoor stuff. 
when you were thinking about like, sure. I would like to work in conservation, did you have an expectation of what that looked like? And if so, is reality meeting that, exceeding that? Where, where are your uh, visions lining up here? That's really interesting because I did. And I thought because of my background, I was likely going to be like a communications manager at some organization. Um, but interestingly enough, because of my background as a project manager, that's how I started in. So I started uh, doing coalition management for the outdoor future. And that's pretty much like, you know, making sure that everyone's on the call, making sure we're taking the right notes, making sure um, all the pieces are moving um, for, for the initiative goals. Um, and then as I, uh, you know, as I started as a National Monuments Fellow, then things really shifted because now I'm more in a, in a different leadership position where I'm more there for brain power, but I'm also for strategic purposes. So a lot of my communications background has been super helpful because every coalition has their communications crew, right? So like I get to be part of that, but then now I also get to be part of the policy groups, right? Which is different, uh, but everything's connected. At the end of the day, you, if, if I get to understand the policy, then I get to communicate that appropriately to the different audiences, right? Because it's also, you're talking to your legislators, you're talking to your community, local community, you're talking to the national community, you're talking to your partner groups, you're talking to your funders. So like, it's a lot of um, just code switching, I guess, and making sure that you know how to appropriately communicate to everyone. So that's kind of cool that I still get to do some communications uh, strategic work while also being able to have some insights in the actual like land management processes. That is so cool. Oh, I love it. Well, yay for this role. I'm so psyched. <laughs> and like you said, you have two jobs because you love them so much. First of all, how the heck did the Outdoors Oath even come up? Like, what is the backstory? Like, we were fortunate enough to be part of the founding member team. Like, we got to see you guys do your first workshop. We got the briefing. We did all the things. But like, where, who had the idea? Where were they when it happened? And how did you get involved? Yeah, that's, um, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's a funny uh, story that I don't own, by the way, so I'll just briefly uh, brush through it, but basically, um, the Outdoorist Oath was co-founded by my colleagues, Teresa Baker, Jose Gonzalez, and Patagonia, and I, my idea of, or my understanding of how it started was like, Teresa said, we need something for planet inclusion and adventure. Like these different buckets have been siloed. We need to bring them together. We need to show people like the intersection of these. Um, and then I guess maybe she called Patty and then Patty called Jose. And then somehow the three of them got together and this um, Outdoors Oath came about. I was brought in as a web and brand designer. And then eventually, because like I've said, I do have a very diverse skill set uh, through my involvement as, as a web designer, primarily because that's a lot of communications, right? When it comes to describing the project and whatnot, um, they all invited me to become the director. And, it, and I was like, well, let me think about this for a second. Like, can I actually do more work? And like, what does that mean for my schedule? And um, so then I went on a long tour of the CDT in New Mexico. And when I came back, they're like, our offer is still standing. Like, we think you'll be the right person to lead this. And I accept it. I mean, it, it's really an honor to have, um, you know, people that I learned from every day in, in the outdoors um, as my colleagues and my co-founders and my mentors. And having their support to, to run the ship. And yeah, it's been, it's been wonderful. So for anyone that's not very familiar with the oath, it's um, as of recent, a nonprofit project that um, is really, yeah, it's, we're really aiming to empower or maybe not empower, my gosh, what's the right word? It's like equip people with tools to help them 
be a better outdoorist, uh, right? So it's like, how do we live it better than we found it for planet inclusion and adventure? So like, not just for, you know, not just for the land. It's not just picking up the trash. It's like, what else do I do in my everyday life? Uh, what are the what are the tools that I have access to that nobody else does that can help me make the outdoors um, more inclusive, that can help me make the planet healthier, that can help me, um, or that can help others see adventure as something for them too. So we primarily offer a two hour public and free of charge workshop that pretty much teaches you the oath framework. And at the end of this very fun two hours, for some reason, like everyone, and this is not just me saying it, like this is the feedback that we get is like, I didn't know Zoom could be that fun. Uh, you know, so like after fun two hours of um, our team preaching at you with some ideas and thoughts and guiding through some exercises and, and hearing from the community and sharing, um, we all get to take the oath together, which is we all get to commit to planet inclusion and adventure. And it's just like this beautiful uh, chaotic ceremony that we love to have on the Zoom and definitely hoping that we can do some um, in person uh, at, at some point uh, soon. But the, yeah, the oath has just been a, a really powerful force. I think it has to do with the timing, like it seems like everyone is ready, right? Like everyone wants to be more involved. Everybody wants to be part of the solution. Everybody's tired to just feel like I'm just sitting here watching the world crumble around me. Like I have no power agency to do anything. And so the oath, we really just aim to allow each person to discover that they do have agency. And like, if we individually make those little changes, like collectively, we're making massive change. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes, you are. Well, and I tell you what, we have already started to shift how we host events, how we run our programs in accordance to the oath that we took. Like, first of all, I have a vision, by the way, before I get into like how you guys have already inspired me to do better. Um, I have a vision of like a stadium tour of oath takers. And it's just like in the round, like 30,000 people all doing it. Like you think it's chaotic on zoom. I want to be in a stadium and hear everybody take that oath. Like that's my dream for you. <laughs> I want it. I really want that. You're not alone. I feel like this is the vision we all want to be there for, you know, like, yeah. and like yes. Patty's coming out, yes. she's strutting her stuff. Like life is good. And then like every crowd goes wild, everybody takes the oath. And then we save the planet together. I love it. Um, but one of the things totally. that I wanted to, that I wanted to share, and I was going to wait until our board meeting to like update everybody all at once, but here we go. I want to share <laughs> how you guys have already inspired me to think bigger and outside the box of to what we were doing previously with hiking my feelings. So we have been in contact now with the Sequoia parks conservancy, and we have two retreats scheduled there for this summer. And when I was talking to Katie, I was like, Hey, um, do you guys have any private campgrounds? Because when we work with Joshua Tree National Park Association, shout out to Katie. Shout out to Katie Whiteman, girl. Thank you. <laughs> so she's awesome. Yes. She's so good. So we reached out and we were talking about having um, our events in the park. And she's like, you know, Kevin told me about it. I'm so glad we're connected. Yes, we do have a camp, but it's a service camp. So if you do a service project, you can stay there. And I was like, oh my God. Yeah. Like I was like, I just heard the oh, this is so perfect. And I was like, well, what's a service project? Like, uh, like a trail cleanup. She's like, yeah, sure. You can do that. I was like, do you have any like in the park that we could support? And she was like, yes. As a matter of fact, we can monitor the monarch sequoia population. What does that mean? That means we're looking at the impact of the fire on the land, because in the last two years during the complex fires, we've lost 15 yeah. to 20% of the entire Sequoia population on the planet. And so we're observing the fire damage. We also, when we monitor Sequoias, we have to measure the circumference of the tree. How do you do that? Well, you fucking hug it. Duh. So we're like, gonna go. I mean, like, obviously they probably have like super scientific tools and stuff, but yes, there will be tree hugging at this retreat. And my biggest inspiration was I was sitting there and I was like, we're talking about how the sequoia tree propagates and it is fire resilient. If you like knocked over a sequoia tree, cut it right. in half, you would see all the fires that survived. And so I was like, oh my gosh, well, what's happening now? Because we have strayed so far 
from indigenous land management practices that there's just fire suppression is like not great for the land. There's dead stuff everywhere. So the fires burn really hot and spread really aggressively. And our cute little sequoias that like need fire to drop cones and then pop out seeds aren't even able to do that because either the fires are going all the way up the tree to the canopy and burning the the pine cone, the cones up there, or they're coming down to the ground where it's too freaking Which hot. Which is a whole other ecosystem too. Yeah. Which is a whole- The canopy is a whole other world that it's needs a whole, to be there too. It's yeah, a whole it's, thing. It's wild. And so we're th I was thinking, I was like, oh my gosh, like what's happening in Sequoia National and National Park and to the tree population is the same thing that's happening to us and our bodies. Like we're ignoring our trauma. We're ignoring our feelings. We're ignoring our pain. We're suppressing, 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 suppressing. We don't allow our inner fire at all. We're told that we're not allowed to be angry, especially as women, that we're not allowed to be mm -hmm. feeling like fiery, like that's not it's not acceptable socially. So when we stuff it down, then at some point we either like erupt like a volcano and it's like verbal or like just anger or in the, like in my case, like I literally, like my body was literally on fire and I was diagnosed with type two diabetes. So like, how can we equate what's happening in the outer yeah. wilderness with our inner wilderness and then protect this land? So thank you Outdoors Elf for making me like think bigger and differently. And thank you, Jose. I think in particular it was Jose's section about like fire. Yes. And it wasn't, it wasn't even like it was, it was so perfect. And I didn't even understand what he was talking about at first. And then like I did more research. And then because like I was like, these are big words, and I feel like really dumb. And then I, I went, like what's a prescribed burn? Like yeah. what's fire suppression? Yeah. Yeah. Of and then terms. And then the Sequoia National Park, they do these giant conversations. And so I went to a webinar that was all about fire and the sequoias. And I was just sitting there watching Katie and all of her moderating glory with some of these experts who are like really entertaining and break down the information in ways that are like easy to understand. Cause I've sat through some like naturalist led things where it's like it's, it's kind of tiring. Like, it's just not, yeah. And it yeah. just goes straight over mm -hmm. my head, but this was just, it was so captivating. And all I could think about was like how this is happening in our bodies and in our brains and bleh, And I was like, oh my God, we have to do this. So that's happening now. And I'm just so excited. That is so exciting. Yeah. You have to send me the dates for that. Cause I need to try to make it. Yeah. So, so the first funny. one is July 15th through the 17th. And that's where we're like hugging trees. And then we're doing one at the end of August, which is a meadow restoration. And on that one, we're removing invasive species and replanting native species. Nice. So we're equating that to like, our, I, I'm calling it meadow mind and like restoring our meadow mind. Cause like, if you like imagine like on your best mental health day, your mind is like an Alpine meadow, right? Like there's a breeze flowing through yeah. grasses, swaying trees, doing what trees do. There's and then we have all these invasive blooming. thoughts. Yes. Wildflowers. <laughs> And then we have like invasive thoughts. So invasive thoughts, invasive species, like how can we restore the meadow and restore our minds? Who knew that nature has so many lessons for us? Right? Who knew? I mean, like, I feel like lots of people knew who and knew? we got so separated from it. Oh yeah. <laughs> I know, right? It's like, who knew everyone until colonization happened and somehow that like, disappeared with and then capitalism happened exactly. and then it kept happening it's like whoa well and i think the really cool yeah. thing and i learned this because i had asked katie i was like hey is there an opportunity to speak with some of the local indigenous community members because like the there are people that have li that live here whose families have managed this land for thousands of years before we got here can we bring them in and talk about what that's like or the cultural significance of these trees and these places and so I don't know if you knew this, I'm sure you probably do because you're a wicked smart cookie and now you work in conservation, but I did not know that the National Park Service has a tribal liaison that is working to develop relationships with people in local communities so they can have opportunities to re-educate those of us that are so, so deeply separated. So fingers crossed we're able to get in touch with somebody and that they're able to support that event and that we can support them as a part of it. Um, but yeah, I just, I am so thankful for the opportunity to be like a very small part of this incredible community of people that are just out here to make the planet a little bit better and make adventure a little bit more accessible <laughs> and to make it more inclusive yes. across the board. And then, well, and the, 
And the thing is like, Sydney, everything you're talking about, that's literally an indigenous way of life. Like if you hear indigenous peoples talking about it, it's like when the land hurts, I hurt because we're not separate from it, right? So like, it's not surprising that as humans living in this capitalist society, we're all burning like a bad wildfire because our whole lives are around suppression. Like we have to be numb. We have to be numb to everything because our privilege requires exploitation elsewhere. And how can we sit here, smile and go have fun while that's happening? Because we suppress, we suppress our core of our humanity. And so like, when you see the destruction around, like that's happening inside too. Whether we're willing to see it, acknowledge it or work through it is different. And so like the fact that you have this beautiful opportunity to like very tangibly tell people like, because what happens? Invasive species come because somebody thought it was a cute idea to bring it or because someone didn't like clean their shoe after going to the national park on the East coast to go to the West coast. Right. Like literally it's like oversight, it's lack of connection. It's like consumerism, like call it whatever it all puts us in the position where we're continuously not only damaging ourselves, but the land. And it's like easy to see like how, how and why they tell you now that like an hour walk in the woods is good for you Yeah. because really what's good for you is to live in the woods. But since (laughs) you don't have that, you now have to go base for an hour. Yeah. Like literally back to our roots back to the indigenous knowledge that a lot of it has um, been lost, but luckily a lot of it has still remained. Yeah. Because there's always been those people that are like, I don't care if I get killed, but I'm going to tell my son about this, or I'm going to tell my grandkids about this, you know? And like that, that is literally the legacy that we are walking on right now. And that like, we have the responsibility to shape or shift shift gears of our world to well, and I, and I think better I, for everyone. I think something, something that I really like about the three different pillars of the outdoorist oath and thinking about like my, frankly, ulterior motive for all things that we're doing is like what happened for me on Catalina Island, the healing that I experienced there, the first call I made was to the Catalina Island Conservancy. Now, this is a different situation than like nationally met or like federally regulated and protected lands like this is like the guy from really gum bought the island and then like donated it so like this is like it's kind of like capitalism but for good but i don't even want to say that out loud because that's gross but that was the first call i made because i wanted to know (laughs) how can i promote and protect this land because i felt healed there and if we can connect people right and you knew and, and you know that they are the managers of that land yeah So if there's ways to, A, have people have healing experiences in nature, then they feel protective of that land for themselves and for future generations because they want other people to heal in that way. And if we can help make them aware through like the work that you guys are doing about who they can get in contact and how they can stand up and how they can advocate for change, then like, then there's nothing we can't do. Like, I honestly, like getting out of that workshop with you guys, I was like, guys, I am on fire in a good way. Like, let's go save stuff. Like we can actually make a difference. Of course. And I think we saw it too. Um, cause I, I had the opportunity of going to the Joshua tree retreat, which was a trail of life retreat at the end of last year. Right. Yes. And so I remember, I think I remember correctly. I think it was, um, I won't say her last name, but Mary brought up that being there with us helped her see another side of the park that she hasn't seen when she's been there before because she got to be more connected to it. So like, it makes sense when you go to heal and you are surrounded by a community that deeply cares about this land, that stuff's contagious. You can't like be there in the middle of a lot of people that care and be the person that doesn't care because (laughs) it doesn't work like that. You will get out like right away even if you're maybe if you don't care but by the end of it you care because you've been there you've seen how much love people are not just giving but receiving and you get to receive that love with the group too because what we got 
beautiful sunrises, amazing sunsets, like campfire story times. I mean, that and that's all like for us to just like hug, you know, like that's like literally nature, like embracing us and taking care of us and like making sure that we're nurtured while we're doing our own internal healing. And at the same time, we're developing that relationship. So we can not, we can't not care about this landscape anymore. Because yeah. now you understand why people were so connected to it. And that's us not even living off of the land or anything. That's just us hanging out, like <laughs> cooking in our little, you know, camp stoves or whatever. Yeah. So last question before we go, um, if you had a magic wand and with that wand, you can use it on yourself, you can use it on the world, you can use it on whoever, whomever, wherever you want. Um, what would you do with your magic wand and, and how would people benefit from your use of it? Oh man, my magic wand. I mean, I think I will just, erase all borders and <laughs> I'll get rid of borders and I will make sure that everybody has um, equal access to all the resources that we have in this earth to share. Yes. And that hopefully nobody can hoard more resources than someone else so that everybody just has the, what is the equal opportunity? Mm. To live a happy life hopefully I, people don't have to work jobs that are like 80 hours a week or 40 hours a week like you know hopefully we can get by with like a 15 hour week and just do more of what we are meant to do and be which is just being one with the landscape and enjoying the views and enjoying the fresh air and live simpler lives that yes. could really make us happy Yes. Oh, I love that. I hope I am excited for you to get your wand in the mail and start making that happen. Gotcha. Man, please. <laughs> All right. So Where's if people my... want to, if people want to connect with you, where can they find you? And um, is there anything that I haven't asked that you want to share or any parting words for our audience today? Well, parting words is, you know, thanks for being part of this community. I much look forward to seeing how, you know, we all continue to make changes together, not just for ourselves, but for each other, because healthy me is healthy you. And we can all um, always share in that in that journey. And so just I'm just grateful that you have encountered hiking my feelings and that you're here. Um, and then to connect just anytime I'm happy to chat, um, you can go to my Instagram at Gabachia, that's G-A-B-S in boy, A-C-C-I-A. And you can DM me, tell me you found out about me on Hiking My Feelings, ask me anything, like I'm always happy to chat. Um, and then, you know, you can also email me from my Instagram, all sorts of things from my Instagram. So um, yeah, that I'm just always happy to connect with folks from the community and hopefully I get to see some of y'all at some of the in-person events this year. Woo! All right. Thank you very much for joining us. And until next time, we will see you. Thank you so much for having me. If you're curious about how to make your next hike a bit more mindful, visit hikingmyfeelings.org slash subscribe to download our free trail thoughts worksheets.